Welcome to the Power Trends Podcast, produced by the New York Independent System Operator, where we discuss energy planning, public policy, and other issues affecting New York's power grid. Hi, I'm Kevin Lanahan, Vice President of External Affairs and Corporate Communications at the New York ISO. Proud to be launching our new Power Trends podcast. And for the first edition, we are proud also to have with us uh, newly installed president and CEO, Rich Dewey. Rich, welcome. Thanks, Kevin. I'm happy to be here. I think this is one of the most exciting times, uh, both in our industry and for our company. All right, Rich, uh, so you started with the the New York ISO back in uh, 2000. So can you describe your career arc for us, the different jobs you had along the way to becoming CEO? Sure. Back before my career at the NISO, I started at uh, Niagara Mohawk, uh, coming right out of Clarkson in 1989. It really uh, gave me a lot of uh, insight and visibility into the utility business and how the power system worked within New York State. So that gave me a a little bit of a perspective about what the utility companies and their customers wanted and demanded from the industry. So I started at the NISO in, in March of 2000. It was a very exciting time. It was a very uh, 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 chaotic time. Being able to jump in in what was in fact a new company and allowed me to get involved in a lot of different problem solving solutions. And I remember uh, going through a battery of interviews that included most of the senior management at the NISO, but also Bill Musler, our first CEO. And I'll never forget at the end of a six hour process of constant interviews and people coming in and out of the room, uh, Bill called me into his office and he said to me, Rich, we really want you to join the New York ISO. We have no idea what your title is going to be. I can't even tell you what you're going to work on, but I will guarantee that you will have fun. And I thought at the time that this is crazy. You know, there's, you know, the certainty of whether this is going to be successful. I didn't initially get that feeling like it was a good idea, but Bill's voice resonated in my head as I drove home. And by the time I got home that day, I said to my wife, I think I'm going to do something crazy. I'm going to take a shot at this job at the New York ISO. And I got to tell you, it has been fun. It has been exciting. It has been exhilarating. This is one of the best places. And I just feel here at the New York ISO, we're smack dab in the middle of it. And I couldn't be happier. I've heard you say, it's very accurate, you know, a bit of an experiment we, as the markets were being set up 20 years ago. We've almost come full circle in terms of that uncertainty. Uh, legislature just passed last week what's being called by many the most aggressive and ambitious uh, renewable investment and carbon reduction program in the country talk about what we need to do in order to address those those challenges yeah it's it's a it's an exciting time it's really almost no different than the challenges we faced back in 99 2000 when you think about how that set of policy objectives was really designed and, and was intended to radically change what was a very firm established utility model within New York State. Markets were proposed as a mechanism to introduce competition and to drive down consumer costs. And now when you look at the new policy objectives, we've got this vexing problem of, of climate change, and we think that our markets are very well positioned to really respond to a new set of objectives. I think it's uh, first and foremost the recognition that there's a new attribute that we need to value in the markets, and that's the ability to provide carbon-free or carbon-reduced electricity. We can't lose sight of the economics, however. We still have that duty and that obligation to be able to think about the cost to consumers. So it's really that dual approach of coming up with still what is the lowest cost Um, most optimized uh, set of schedules that can meet the demand, but it's also thinking about how do we factor in and price appropriately that new attribute, which is carbon reduction and renewables. And I think that balance is achievable. I think the markets can do that. I think it's going to be working closely with our stakeholders to come up with that set of rules and incentives and working with the policymakers to make sure that we're achieving those policy objectives in a manner that is um, you know, most advantageous to the consumers in New York. Uh, you know, one of the things that we like to say is that the markets provide um, uh, almost an incubator for new technologies and innovation. So uh, beyond storage, what else do we see um, uh, is on the, on the horizon in terms of uh, those intermittent resources that we want, we want to try and attract? Well, one of the things that, that uh, we're very mindful of is, is these goals are really challenging. When you start thinking about some of these very aggressive policy goals, of, of serving 70% of the load with renewables or serving 100% of the load with renewables or zero carbon resources, um, 
I don't know if we've got the technology and the capabilities today. And one of the things that we're looking at is really the need for new technology and innovative development. And we firmly believe that in order to get that kind of innovation, you really need a market signal. Definitely not a uh, an either or scenario, right? That either markets or subsidies. It, it it seems like the pathway forward, and and I've heard you talk about you know an all of the above scenario and approach. Um, so, um, can you describe a little bit about? Sure. That yeah. Vision? I mean, it's going to take all those different levers to help make these goals successful. When, when you look at some of these new technologies, the industries are pretty immature, and it's going to require some subsidies to help jumpstart them and to get that kind of investment into the uh, into the manufacturing cycle and then over time the cost of those assets whether it's solar panels or it's wind turbines or it's storage or it's battery technology we expect that the manufacturing costs of those will decline and the need for subsidies will go down but to get the kind of private investment there's a compatibility between um, what the subsidies can provide what the markets can provide to the table to help us all achieve these goals we have undertaken this project a couple of years down the road now on this project with regard to carbon pricing and um, you know, the basic underlying objective there is to um, achieve efficiencies again in, in the marketplace can you start at the beginning and explain to the listeners where we uh, started on this project how we've gotten to where we are um, and what our what our goals are it started about two years ago when we recognized that the uh, policy objectives with respect to carbon and, and, and the interest in uh, increasing the amount of renewables on the system were really taking off. And uh, we got together with the New York State Public Service Commission and we said, uh, recognizing that um, markets have been uh, wildly successful in reducing the overall cost to consumers, why don't we look at how effective markets could be in helping solve this carbon reduction problem and use markets, or maybe we can achieve more greater levels of carbon reduction if we use markets. And, and up to this point, you, you know, the nitrogen reductions and the sulfur reductions have been you know, a huge benefit from markets as well. So. Yeah, the greatest efficiency means that the older, less efficient, and therefore dirtier units end up running less. And the cleaner, more efficient, more cost-effective units run more. So when you look at the 20 years of New York ISO markets, we've seen a natural reduction in, uh, in a whole host of pollutants, including carbon dioxide. So let's explore a way that we can use markets more aggressively to try to reduce carbon. And uh, we w took a study on and we looked at efficiency gains we could get. If we included the social cost of carbon in the optimization and engine that establishes um, the schedules to meet the consumer load every day, um, could that be a more cost-effective means of achieving the renewable goals? And, and I think it's important to note that at that time, before we embarked on the study, we went back to market participants and said, you want us to initiate this study? And they said, yes. That's right. And our market participants, most of them have a very intense interest in seeing this be successful and that have been working collaboratively with us over the last couple of years to achieve that set of market rules. Now we're looking at it from a standpoint of um, a more aggressive set of policy objectives where, we're, where we've raised the bar from uh, uh, targeting 50% of our consumption from renewables in 2030 to 70%. And we're also looking at some of the value that storage might bring to the table and the ability to use storage to capture some of the uh, output of renewables when demand is low and use it again later in the day when demand is high. So um, could that be a more economic approach to achieving some of these goals. There was a policy debate over whether or not uh, carbon was having uh, an impact on the environment. That seems to be a foregone conclusion almost nationally at this point. Uh, so now the question seems to be, especially in the wake of the aggressive legislation, whether or not our carbon pricing uh, model and approach takes on greater importance or lesser importance uh, that question has been asked of us by the media. It's come up in our governance process. Maybe you can answer it for, you, for yourself and, and what we think. We think a carbon pricing mechanism within our markets becomes more valuable in trying to achieve these policy goals because the level of attainment is now more certain in terms of what the legislation is mandating. When you look at how difficult it's going to be to achieve these goals on the timeline, it's really going to require an all-in approach. And I think that 
the complement of using some of the subsidies that the clean energy standard has put in place with a market mechanism to help drive that level of innovation and market response, those two programs working together give New York the greatest chance of success of achieving these goals. And walking around the building, and, and I know you, you observe this and you share this, it, it's clear that everybody um, understands what the purpose is here. And we've got um, a huge opportunity to make a difference, uh, make a difference in the environment, technology, innovation, policy. Um, two things that you want people to remember um, from this interview and then also to expect from your leadership going forward. Sure. I, I think you, w when you look at what's important in your career and your job, you want two things. You want it to be interesting. There's nothing more interesting than the energy space right now. And you also want it to be important. And the job that we do here at the New York ISO is about as important to our economy, to, to the safety and welfare of the people of the state in New York, to consumers. And, and I want people to recognize those two elements of this job and to really understand uh, what a great opportunity we have here at the New York ISO. I just had a brand new hire said to me yesterday, um, just graduated from school, just showed up on the job. He came into my office to say hello to me and he told me this is the best job in the country and I'm so thrilled to have this job. That's what I want every employee at the New York ISO to feel every day when they walk out of this building. Thanks, Rich. This has been a wide ranging, in-depth, comprehensive discussion. We've covered a lot of territory. I'm sure our listeners will uh, find a lot of use in this and we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Great, thanks for having me, a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us. As a reminder, the New York Independent System Operator, NISO for short, is responsible for reliably managing New York's power grid and energy markets and providing independent data to policymakers and the public. For more independent info, please visit the NISO blog at www.nyiso.com blog.